everyone. I'm Cheryl Cohen. I'm with Arthritis Consumer Experts, and we're hosting the hashtag See Arthritis event. Uh, Dr. Diane Lakai, I'm so thrilled, Dr. Lakai, uh, to have you here in studio with us and helping us bookend this in fantastic eighth annual um, event that we hold as part of uh, the scientific meeting. So thrilled to have you in the studio. It's my pleasure, Cheryl. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about you, Dr. Lakai, before we dig into our conversation. Uh, so folks, uh, we're sitting here with a, a very famous uh, doctor, <laughs> uh, researcher. Um, Dr. Diane Lakai is the scientific director of Arthritis Research Canada and a senior scientist there. She's also a professor in the Division of Rheumatology. She heads the, uh, she's the Associate Head of Academic Affairs in the Department of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. She holds a clinical practice in Vancouver, British Columbia, and also is the chair of the Mary Pack, uh, is the Mary Pack chair, pardon me, in rheumatology research uh, of UBC and the Arthritis Society. So that's a mouthful. There are a lot of things going on in your life, uh, Dr. Lakai, and we are so happy to have you here. We know that many, many years ago, BC stole you from McGill University, uh, and you're, you're now, I think we can fairly call you a Vancouverite, can't we? <laughs> a Vancouverite with a, a, a Montrealer at heart. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Ça, ça reste toujours pas du cœur. <laughs> ah, merci. Uh, we know that um, your, your bench strength really is in cl clinical epidemiology. You've done years of work in rheumatoid arthritis, um, in looking at what happens to people like me who live with rheumatoid arthritis in the workplace, um, in, in broader community settings. You've done tons of work uh, with indigenous communities. Uh, your, your work just spans, um, I, I like to say all of the really people-y stuff, like all the stuff that really matters to people like me, stuff that's super applicable and important and, and was before your arrival onto the research scene, we knew nothing about what was happening with people with RA in the workplace yeah. um, or, or up in our indigenous communities. So, I want to thank you for that and also acknowledge that you and I are, are blessed to be on the land of the Coast Salish people. We gather, live, and work uh, here. It is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Slawetu. So we're, I know we're both very grateful uh, yes. to be here speaking together on this beautiful land. So we're going to talk today, um, Dr. Lakai, about something very specific that you and I we're on a panel at the annual scientific meeting of the Arthritis Health Professions Association. And, and that's really about bias mm -hmm. and bias in the healthcare system um, and both conscious or unconscious or implicit bias. I mean, there's lots of ways to talk about bias and you're gonna shed some light on that. Um, and really this topic, we talked about it last week to really push forward on our path to equity and inclusiveness mm -hmm. in care delivery in Canada, and specifically in arthritis where we know inequities exist. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'd like to, I guess, start off by asking you um, to maybe give us that brief de definition of bias and, um, and how does it affect the delivery of healthcare? All right. Well, thank you, Cheryl, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak about this. I think, um, you know, as you mentioned, as I've done work around uh, uh, the quality of care uh, for people with arthritis, it's very obvious that a lot of inequities exist, and uh, uh, we have to do a lot of work if we want to be uh, uh, achieving equity. Um, and e equity in care delivery means that uh, there's inequitable health outcomes and, and people suffer in a way that's, uh, that's completely unacceptable. Sorry, just a little preamble. Uh, yeah, so, no. um, so, you know, biases is, is, um, is, is something that we all have to become so much more aware of. And I think it's really important for people to not dismiss it and not say, oh, I have no biases because I'm not racist, I'm not sexist, et cetera. You know, we have to recognize that we all have biases 
They stem from our upbringing, from our personal experiences, things that have happened to us over our life, things that have happened to the generations before us that we carry as the history of our people, from society around us, the books we read, the movies we watch, the music we listen to, et cetera. It's everywhere. Yeah. And I don't want to focus so much on the explicit bias, which is the overt intentional bias of when people have some beliefs that they are completely aware of, that they believe that certain groups are less worthy or are or, or inferior. I'm talking about the implicit bias, the unconscious one, the ones where people have automatic thoughts that they're not even aware of, but that unfortunately those thoughts influence how they perceive, but even more importantly, how they act uh, towards certain groups. And that as a health professional is completely unacceptable. I mean, we start from the premise that we offer the best care to everyone. So if we have unconscious biases that come from our personal life that influence how we provide care, we need to do that personal work to unpack those biases Absolutely. and to, to recognize them because when something's automatic, until you recognize it, you can't act on it. It's almost like de deprogramming yourself it, in some ways. And, and I'm thinking- I love that. I love that word. To you, Dr. Deprogramming. Lekai, yeah. I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, well, what sort of the number one thing we as patients know is that you, you swear a Hippocratic oath when you yeah. get a license. That's, and the first thing is do no harm. Well, yeah. Bias does harm. It does. Bias does harm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think people tend to think of the more obvious biases, like the biases uh, on, on race and on gender, but there are, and on sexual orientation or gender identity, but there are other, a lot of other biases, you know, biases uh, against religion, but also biases against weight and age and disability and socioeconomic status, education, even biases due to beauty that we treat different people differently um, in, in our interactions that can affect, and biases can affect in so many different ways in the context of clinical care. It can affect what I offer to a patient as, uh, as a treatment or what investigations I might decide to do. It also affects how I communicate with them, but it also affects the receiving end. So how I interact with a, with a patient interacts how connected they feel, how much they will trust the advice that I will give, how adherent they are going to be to the uh, to what I prescribe or what I recommend, how likely they are to come for follow up. So, you know, a lot of those things that then people say they put that responsibility back on the patient are actually really dependent on what I did and how I interacted and how I created um, that, you know, that relationship. So it's taking so I, personal responsibility yes. as a healthcare provider for, for a lot of that. So I think, you know, and so in terms of what we need to do as clinicians, we need to look, think about our personal biases, but we also need to think the biases that are at the organizational level and at the system level in our practice. Uh, so that we, uh, you know, deconstruct those biases uh, and that we, um, uh, you know, that, 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 that we dismantle this. And, you know, we talk also about power and privilege. And I think we have to recognize that as a physician, and so if I speak for myself, you know, as a white, the settler, doctor, and a professor at the university, I hold a lot of privilege and I hold a lot of power and I need to sort of work at, at dismantling or using that power to dismantle some of those power structures that cause inequities. Give us a real concrete example for our audience. Tell us how bias uh, and inequity plays out in a particular healthcare setting. Well, I'm gonna give you a very salient example. Uh, you know, just recently, uh, Dr. Cheryl Barnaby uh, uh, in Calgary uh, with a group of other uh, Indigenous uh, researchers did uh, a study looking at bias in the emergency room. And 
you know, their results confirmed what we have already known and what so many indigenous patients have been expressing and telling us, uh, which is that they do not receive the same priority and the same treatment when they present to the emergency room. So what their study showed was that when uh, indigenous patients presented in urgent care or emergency department for the same complaint, they were prioritized as a lower priority. They waited longer in order to be seen, even when they were presenting with urgent uh, uh, problems. So, you know, it's, it's what the patients have been telling us. Yeah. They won't go to eMERGE unless they absolutely have to, because they know they're not going to be treated seriously as seriously. So they wait until things are really, really more extreme before they present. Yeah. There's also, you know, other data showing that uh, Black patients uh, do not, uh, that, that, that the treatments offered to Black patients for pain is less than the treatment offered to white patients with pain, and that there is a belief by some physicians that Black people don't perceive pain as much, um, which is just horrifying. And, and there's lots of other examples of really studies showing inequities in terms of how uh, the care that is offered, uh, that certain groups uh, present to care later and have worse outcomes. And definitely with the indigenous peoples in uh, Canada. Yeah. Who unfortunately I mean, have more often, uh, have a greater rates of arthritis uh, and more severe disease but are, are receive less treatment and have worse outcomes. And have a much harder time getting to someone like yourself, for example, yes. get, even yes. getting to the right specialist. Um, and, all of yeah. that is heartbreaking. And I'm so encouraged um, that you, are, uh, Ace, so many of us in our arthritis community are now on the path um, to reconciliation, to, to action, to address bias and inequity. When, you know, we have a lot of arthritis health professionals who tune into um, this program, Dr. Lakai. And so if you could, let's spend the rest of our, our few minutes together here talking about real practical solutions, mm -hmm. you know, things that clinicians can do to make it easier for people um, who do face inequity, who do face bias, that is well documented, as you pointed out. Um, through across the transom into their clinics every day. Tell us, tell, help share your experience and your expertise and your growing expertise. I know you yes. say you're not an expert, um, but I'm you're, learning. <laughs> you're learning by doing. And I think that's just so valuable. Um, it's all about action. So tell mm -hmm. us what action uh, folks can take. Well, I think the first action is your work on yourself. So, yeah. and, and we've already talked about this, you know, you need to do the personal work to identify and work on your personal biases. And then you have to try in your day-to-day -day clinical work, identify those biases. So there should, you should have situations that create little red flags in your brain, you know, this little red alert that, can, yeah. that we always talk about in medicine. So, you know, when you have gut reactions to specific things, challenge that. Uh, because maybe that's the result of a bias. So, uh, you know, challenge all assumptions. And before sort of assuming that a certain patient isn't going to be able to afford physiotherapy, for example, or isn't going to want a certain treatment because you think they're averse to taking medications. So challenge those assumptions. Never act on assumptions. Ask, you know, you can ask in a sensitive way if you suspect that maybe they might be um, less inclined, but always ask, never assume. Right. Suspend all judgments, you know, uh, rev revise your conclusion based on facts. Don't go on gut feelings and, and impressions. Use facts, use evidence, ask the questions. Um, another thing that we talk about because of these studies showing that what we offer can differ, well, have a systematic approach. A systematic approach reduces systemic biases uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, racist way of delivering care. So use standardized proce procedures, use checklists, you know, so that way the care you offer is the same for everyone because you've gone through a systematic process. Um, and then, you know, if you do 
recognize that you've said something or done something uh, and, and that you've actually done a microaggression, recognize it, own it, apologize, apologize for the impact, not the intent. So because you didn't mean to doesn't right. take the hurt away. So talk about the impact. You can say you didn't mean to, but don't dwell on that. You know, talk about the impact and uh, and and then rebuild, reconnect. Um, so that's kind of at, at a personal level. Um, and those are just some ideas. I'm sure there's a lot of you know other ways. Yeah. Um, and then look at your policies, make sure that your policies and your way that your practice functions um, is uh, it, it has no systemic bias in it, that your your policies are mindful of some of the barriers that certain group face. And, you know, so this uh, includes when I walk through the door, what's hanging on your walls, how you're greeted at reception, the materials yes. that are sitting on your waiting table. Yeah, so those are, you know, the examples you give are really important. Uh, you know, I was getting at in terms of policies, more things like some people have, if you have a no show, you can never, you don't come back. You right. Know? So those kinds of policies, you know, I think those need to be applied with caution. Uh, but you're right. What you're talking about and is a really other important point is making our practice inclusive. Uh, how do we make our practice welcoming and inclusive to all to the diversity of patients. So, you know, those visual cues are very important. Make sure that you're, and, and people who faced inequities are looking for those cues because so many times they faced microaggressions and they've been uncomfortable. They're on the lookout for those cues that tell them, oh, this is a safe place. Right. This is a place where I will be treated with respect and equity. So the things I say might sound little, but they actually go a long way. So having pictures uh, that reflect racial diversity, that reflect same sex, sorry, same sex couples, um, you know, that have a diverse vision of a family, uh, having symbols of uh, uh, like uh, e equality symbols, Black Lives Matter symbols, rainbows, uh, orange shirts, you know, those symbols that give those cues, Indigenous art, you know, those symbols are important. Um, having non-specific or non-specific gender bathrooms, for example. Yes. Um, you know, if you, if, if, yeah. if you have control over that, having yeah. gender neutral bathrooms, but also how making sure, you know, they say like the, 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 the first contact with the reception at your office is really important. So making sure that your receptionist greets people and asks about their pronouns, about their preferred names, uh, the pronunciation of their name, and then that you have a system so that it's flagged, so you don't keep asking or making the same mistakes all the time. Yeah, you know that yeah. is that goes that goes a long way at uh, you know creating a culture of inclusivity, of dignity, and of respect, and making sure that you have an equity statement and that it's visible and that it includes gender orientation, uh, uh, sorry, gender identity and sexual orientation. And, um, and, may, and also making sure that it says how, what's people's recourse if they're not being treated in an equitable way in your, in, in your practice. So, you know, those, those are, are just all, some those are all fantastic uh, ideas and, and, and not beyond ideas, they're actions people should be taking um, to make certain that the environment people like me walk into um, uh, is, is welcoming to everyone. I have to say, I'm listening to you, Dr. Lakai, and I'm thinking back on my 32 years, and I am white. I am who would be considered privileged. Um, and I think about how hard patients work the minute they walk through the door yeah. to be liked, to yeah. do everything they can, to dress the part, like to, to make sure they're taken seriously. So patients walk in sick with significant diseases and they're the ones working to yeah. try to get this equitable care. And it's yeah. so wrong. And it, yeah. I'm, so I'm so heartened to hear all of these things that the health professional community can and should be doing yeah. to make sure I don't have to work so hard. And I'm using I loosely here, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that patients who do face um, inequities 
uh, racial bias, um, gender bias, that they don't have to work so hard coming in when they're not well. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. We, we should be the one doing the work, doing the work. Yeah. I completely agree. You know, when you think about um, sort of the way forward um, with your colleagues, obviously holding more workshops, doing learning uh, in through your medical school uh, curricula across the country. What are some other things you think that prof health professional associations, like the one that you belong to, the Canadian Rheumatology Association, patient organizations like ours, what do you see as some of the things we can be doing individually and as a collective? Well, I think, you know, I was, uh... It, it was very uh, encouraging to see the theme of this year's annual scientific meeting uh, being uh, about um, moving towards equity in, in rheumatology care, yeah. uh, because I think the first thing that as a professional organization we can do is uh, working on awareness until people are aware that a problem exists, uh, you can't fix a problem. Uh, yeah. So I think awareness, I think uh, uh, advocacy. Uh, I think continuing to document and publish because unfortunately, um, you know, just impressions are not enough and having facts that back up what uh, the stories we're hearing and the things we're seeing are very powerful. Data is a very powerful uh, weapon <laughs> um, because it's what drives, uh, dr drives chains and dri drives agenda. So I think we can be involved in documenting this uh, and then I think, uh, but we also need policies. We need policy change. Um, I think we have to do work at the individual level, but also at, at the system level, if we wanna change uh, systemic racism and uh, systemic discrimination uh, against other groups that face inequity. Yeah. Um, there's other strategies that, uh, for example, right now, there's a, a, a great movement towards virtual care that's come out of COVID-19 and how it's changed how you know, we, we practice rheumatology. Well, let's leverage that and let's use these opportunities to also, if used carefully and uh, being mindful of the potential to increase inequities if people don't have access to the technology uh, that allows to do virtual care. Virtual care also has uh, really the opportunity to reduce a lot of health and well to to reduce some health inequities so you know I think this is a, but we have to have very specific policies as to how it's used etc and I know that the uh, the Canadian Rheumatology Association has been very involved in that field as well sort of having some some guidelines but I think you know we need to work with we need to work and partner with government with organizations and with patients we have to have the patient, voice at the table uh, and we need to have the the groups who are facing the inequities represented at the table when we are speaking and when we are um, devising those solutions so because you know it's it's their lived experience that is going to tell us all these different ways that we're unaware of that are actually increasing those inequities. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, these, I'm sure there's more and I'm sure when I, when we end this interview, I'll think about it. You'll think of 20 other, other things. things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, off the top of my head, those are just some, some, uh, some low hanging fruit, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but I think we also have to recognize this is going to take work. This is going to take time. This is going to take commitment. And we have to commit to not just words and educating and workshops, which are important, but they're only the beginning bit. Un unless this is also translating to change in policy and personal involvement where each person agrees to be an active ally. So an active ally, so someone who acts, uh, we're not going to change this. And yeah. so it's going to require a concerted effort where we work at all levels to make those changes. And uh, the professional organizations just need to go along and, and do the work. Yeah, it's that uh, it's going to rip off uh, Nike, just do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> sometimes you have to act without, you have the essential facts you need, which is inequity exists, it's significant and it yeah. really, affects people in a negative way. 
for, for us as a patient organization, those are facts enough to act, right? And yeah. we continue to collect facts and data along the way. Um, Dr. Lakai, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us today to talk about bias, um, what it is, how it plays out in the healthcare system, and what healthcare professionals can do to begin to address it from, from their side of the healthcare delivery equation. Uh, you know that arthritis consumer experts will um, steadfastly uh, work with you uh, in this effort. We have led a number of initiatives ourselves. We'll be giving some more information at the end here on a slide, links people can visit. Uh, we'll direct them to your website as well uh, to learn more about this area of work um, at, at ARC. And uh, I just wanna thank you so much for your commitment um, to, addressing, uh, to addressing inequity in arthritis care. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Cheryl. And I know that this is something that uh, uh, really matters to you. And yeah. uh, I uh, um, also really want to uh, um, uh, acknowledge uh, how and, and uh, it, it, thank you for doing that work. And uh, it's a pleasure to be, to be on that learning path with you um, and, and with and, and for the people who are, are facing yeah. inequities. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Dr. Lakai. Have a great day and we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks everyone for tuning in. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs>